So in, 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 in some ways, the, uh, a lot depends on where you position reciprocity. If you're um, in the H squared stream and, and you, you, you have this self-interested person kind of thinking about whether I want reciprocity or not, or just pursuing uh, his, his or her own particular self-interest. And, and the Ostrom uh, stream and, and others, we read Benkler in this class, um, the reciprocity is, is there at the start. And, right. and that, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Absolutely. And the problem that Hobbes has is how do you, it's a kind of a catch-22 problem. If we have a structure here where there's social expectations of reciprocity and people therefore are benefiting from those networks that provide that kind of reciprocity and the opportunities to engage cooperatively with others and making it better off, then it's in your self-interest yeah. to, to play by the rules. Right. In structures, in places where you don't have it, then how do you get it rolling? Yeah. Because that requires trust. Right. And if you don't already have reciprocity, how can you, how have you trust? generate trust? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we're, we're, we're going to be talking to uh, Lewis Hyde in this, in this class, whose work on the, on the commons and, and, uh, has been so important and on the gift for artists in the United States and for thinking about intellectual property. And, and he, he really insists on the, uh, on, on the, the mistake of trying to separate the ego or the individual from systems of reciprocity as a starting point because, because then you're always concerned about how to protect that individual rather than how to nourish an ongoing, um, web of reciprocity that is part of what it means to be human. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, you know, a kind of concrete example of that is the shift we see in many areas of public policy mm -hmm. towards um, focusing on the incentives that providers are offered for engaging in certain kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. And we have these wonderful words like incentivize oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so yes. forth. And uh, the alternative to that would be codes of professional conduct mm -hmm. or professional ethics in mm -hmm. which people, providers, see themselves as having responsibilities to the uh, community, responsibilities yes. to the profession, that their profession comes with tied to a moral good. Interesting, yes. So that my performance as a lawyer, as an yes. educator, is not uh, to uh, measured by how much how the returns I make for right. it, but rather by my conformity to a certain code of ethics and my realization of the purposes that the profession is defined around. And profession, you think about health is defined around the, I mean, uh, the, uh, physicians are defined in terms of the value of health. Their right. lawyers are defined in the value of justice and right. education in terms of the values of knowledge. And so when you try to affect my behavior by incentivizing me, right. I actually may become more of a ego <laughs> right, egoist right. than I would have been before, and that brings us to the idea that what do people count as part of their self-interest, yes. and that's going to be part of their identity. Right, and that identity isn't just uh, individual; isn't just isolated. Right, yeah. we form our identities right. through comparison of ourselves with others, right. through the social interactions that we engage in, and so forth. And this is Bankler's big theme, right? Is that that um, uh, it, the mistake we make is to think that we just layer on the social after the, the core individuality is there. Right. Core individual, as you just said, core individuality is constructed in relationship. And uh, he likes to use these examples in contemporary technology about w Wikipedia, for example. One of his, his favorite examples is that, that uh, cooperation can become part of one's ethos and not... Uh, and it goes all the way down. It's not something you just layer on and, and, uh, or, or try to maximize your individual good through your being a lawyer or being a, an editor of Wikipedia. It's just, it's just, it's part of who you are in relation to others. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and his idea, he argues along with, um, many others that our intellectual property laws in this country have become way out of whack yes. because by 
creating these very strong property rights and ideas and knowledge and so on and so forth, they wall people off from each other, yeah. and the growth of culture and the growth of knowledge and so on and so forth is a function of the free flow of ideas yes. and so forth. You don't write something de novo. Right. You, you are responding to the voices uh, of your culture and of your tradition. And yes. if you can't appropriate th those ideas and transform them, you can't produce anything new. Exactly. And so the whole idea behind intellectual property laws is that it's supposed to give people the incentive to come up with new ideas and so on and so forth. Yeah. But if you push, push it too far in that right. direction, you actually undercut yeah. the growth of knowledge. And this is Hyatt's theme as well, Lewis Hyatt's theme as well. <clears throat> and we had uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig visit Wesleyan a few years ago, and I'm hoping to talk with him in the context of this class as well, uh, just, on, just on this theme about how the emphasis on protecting the individual actually can be an impoverishment, both of the cultural and of the individual, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ultimately. Right. Uh, uh, in this course, the, um, you know, it, it, we are, we're, we're starting off with this, uh, this idea of a social good uh, because it's, it's, it, we're, and we've chosen themes that are not, um, I'll put it this way, particularist. So we're going uh, on next week to talk about uh, uh, poverty and uh, uh, how to how to combat it, especially extreme poverty. Then we'll be talking about climate change, and then we'll be talking about issues around education, uh, especially education and gender. And the, you know, we've chosen these large themes because um, hope, I hope that students uh, who who are participating in the class won't say, "Well, I don't really care about." climate change, that's not my business, or I don't care about education, it's not my business. It seems like it's a human business, it's part of our social being mm -hmm. uh, that, the, uh, th that we have to confront these issues that they're not something we can just separate ourselves mm -hmm. from. Yeah, well, you think about climate change. This is very much a tragedy of the common situation. Yes. It uh, has structurally, it has that form. And you've heard, and there, uh, one proposal that's often put forward to address it is a cap and trade system. Yes. Cap and trade system, in effect, creates property rights in the atmosphere. Yes. So it's very much a Lockean yeah. uh, kind of thing in terms of what we were talking yes. about before. Uh, carbon tax, on the other hand, I suppose you could say it's, well, it's, uh, it's a more rule-bound approach, but yes. it's not, uh, I, I won't go down that road. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's more complicated, right? Yeah, uh, but that, that it does. Um, you, you need a strong external authority, I guess. I, I well, you need some system of social organization right. to take care of it, and uh, Ostrom's work uh, depends heavily, for example, upon the idea that that the actions of people are visible to each other. Yes. Since climate change is a global problem, right. we there's no way of settling outside of some kind of s systematic structure of authority that will generate rules that everybody will follow. But it doesn't have to be a, a Leviathan or a right. Hobbesian kind of approach, because since it's in everyone's interest to follow those rules, if everyone else is doing so, if we could develop a structure through which the rules could be agreed, yes. then uh, it's reasonable to think that that structure will be effective, even if there's some free riding that goes on. Yeah, it's interesting. In her work, the, she, she points out these, these uh, systems of co uh, communal management or right. communal participation that preserves resources over, over long periods of time um, that work so well because of the kind of tradition of trust. Right. And I guess one of the things we're trying to confront now is how do you jumpstart that or how do you ignite traditions of trust without creating a Leviathan mm -hmm. uh, to do it? And, and one of the themes um, in this class will be how do we promote social good? I mean, I, I'm, this is a class we're not asking people to, to become uh, Marxists or liberals or conservatives or anarchists. You know, we're not asking people to, to, to subscribe to an ideology, but we are asking people to think about how they can promote social good, how they can promote um, an enrichment of the commons, I guess, in yes, the language yeah. we've been used today, using today. And uh, 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 Are there authors that you uh, teach or, or have been thinking about that give us any indications or help about this notion of how can you promote or add to um, the enrichment of the commons, of the social good? A while ago we were talking about the conditions under which people acting individualistically in terms of their own projects and self-interests 
and I would like to use the word self-interest in a very broad, things that they care about. Things they care about. Um, can produce optimal outcomes and situations in which it won't produce optimal outcomes. Right. And economists talk about the difference between these things is the question of externalities. Right. To the extent that my behavior impacts you in ways that aren't consensual, that you that don't involve your agreeing to right. that impact, yes. uh, then the decentralized kinds of approaches are problematic. Mm -hmm. And so the global warming uh, example is a case in point where uh, as long as there are, people are free to put carbon into the atmosphere, uh, the, the people who put the carbon in the atmosphere are, are enjoying the full benefits of right. the energy that they're producing or the, or the uh, revenues they get from selling that energy, and the people, uh, but they're not paying the full cost. Right. The costs are being spread out across the world. And so, so here you clearly have to move away from the decentralized kind of approach. But when we think about the, um, the ways in which interests are related, rooted in our identities, and the way identities are rooted in our social lives, in the structure of our social lives, we can see that um, in addition to these models of decentralized, self-interested, market-like things mm -hmm. and coordinated kinds of activities, either through states or through associational or communal arrangements, we also see how um, people's conceptions of their own good can be more or less tied to social goods. Yes. To, so that if, to the extent, for example, that you see yourself as a citizen, mm -hmm. you view, say, the non-payment of taxes differently right. from the way if you just see yourself as an atomistic individual yeah. uh, is concerned about your own consumption bundle or your household's mm -hmm. consumption bundle. So uh, to the extent that you see yourself as a professional or as a mm -hmm. doctor or, or educator, you, as opposed to a small business person or a person who's out to maximize their household income, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see your interests differently and then in acting in a self-interested way, you'll also be acting in a way that promotes the social good because you've incorporated right. the social good into your own identity. So I think what we'll see, at least what I hope we see in this class, is that People uh, who are studying with us uh, on uh, concerning these large-scale global challenges will begin to see how these challenges are relevant to them um, as citizens of different parts of the world, as as activists. I think many people who are involved in in the social goods summit see themselves as activists, see themselves as trying to make a positive difference in the world. Um, and not just be for their own uh, consumption bundle, <laughs> but uh, because they see themselves as enwebbed in a world that uh, faces uh, extraordinarily uh, dangerous consequences because of our pursuit of um, uh, particular self-interest or uh, because of our pursuit of um, policies that lead to radical inequality. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do in the class, and, and this is really an experiment, at least from my perspective, is to encourage uh, the students to think about very specific, and I would imagine small-scale things they can do that would contribute to the social good, to, mm -hmm. to, to, and to try to write briefly about that and what, what that might be, what kinds of alliances they create, what kind of specific actions they create that if you will return something to the commons or, or, or re replenish the social good to some extent. Um, and and I, I think the, the, um, the first thing we have to do uh, is to have s uh, some shared sense of what the facts are. So we're going to be talking in regard to uh, uh, poverty uh, next week about what do we know about extreme poverty? What are some of the you know, what do the economists tell us? What, what, do, what are some of the best um, appraisals of uh, the issue uh, 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 in contemporary social science? And then 
The second part, which I guess relates back to this notion of re- relationship or in Webig, is why you should care. You know, mm-hmm. if you're if you're watching this class, you may not actually. Chances are you're not suffering from extreme poverty. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you have a good internet connection. You know about Coursera. You're interested in, and you have access to these materials. Uh, you're not struggling just to survive. What? But why should you care about extreme poverty? And then the third thing is that what what might you do? Not that we're going to solve supreme, uh, extreme poverty in this class, but what might you do that would be positive, um, right. that would give back to this commons? Right. Right, that's, that's really interesting. And, and uh, one thing, one ex- kind of social science research I might just mention yes. is the um, Wilkinson and Pickett uh, right. work, and it's kind, of, kind of odd title of the spirit level, But they look at inequality and measures of social well-being among rich countries. Mm -hmm. And they begin with the observation, which has been confirmed over and over again, that measures of subjective well-being go up quite quickly with income. But then after you've escaped poverty, it really flattens out. And that's it's also true at the at the national level yes. as well. Uh, among countries that are relatively rich, there isn't much correlation between how rich they yeah, are and, how happy and, they are. and, and, and yeah. people's subjective me- measures of well-being. What's really remarkable is that among the countries that are relatively rich, there is a very high level of. Uh, correlation between equality and bene- and good social outcomes. Huh. They test this looking at OECD nations, the, the, the club of rich countries, yes. and they also test it looking within the United States, the 50 states of the United States. And so they look at the how many, what proportion of your population is in prison, mm-hmm. and uh, what, how much inequality is there? What proportion right. of your population commits suicide? Right. How much inequality? Yeah. And it's remarkable. Over and over and over again, they find that equality is associated with better outcomes for everybody. Mm. Why should you care? Well, because if you live in a relatively more equal society, you're likely to have a better life. Yes. Because living in a less equal society is going to give you a higher level of material well-being, maybe. Maybe, if yeah. you're at the top, you're at the top yeah. <laughs> but what's that going to do for you in terms of of real well-being? Because the law of diminishing returns sets in. That's right. Way to uh, bring our conversation to a close. The 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 um, the uh, the wager of this class is to uh, by by getting some key facts out there, by uh, sharing stories, and by sharing strategies for um, dealing with these uh, global challenges. We will have a, a sense of participation in a community, um, and and uh, we'll have a sense of of uh, mitigating, uh, at least trying to mitigate some of the nefarious effects of of, of inequality, of the depletion of the commons, uh, uh, of uh, the perpetuation of uh, uh, unequal access to education. That increasing awareness and giving people tools for action. Uh, will um, give us a sense, perhaps, of of greater well-being, but more importantly, of greater capacity to uh, an, initiate change and more control over our the conditions of our collective existence. Yeah, I mean, this is politics is often thought of as a struggle for power, where everybody is out yeah. to get. Who Laswell said, it, the title of his famous book, "Politics: Who Gets What, When, right. and How," <laughs> but really. The political is the sphere where we can separate ourselves from what's going on in our society and see how we are interacting in ways that may be producing outcomes that we don't want and then trying to take that into account and restructure the way we do things so that we can uh, create outcomes that we that we do want and so have more control over our, our lives as uh, as individuals, but that can only be done cooperatively. Yes. Well, Professor Donald Moon, thank you so much for this conversation. Well, pleasure. Really fun to do, and uh, I, I look forward to uh, more more discussions uh, over the course of the semester. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you.